<clears throat> from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Beloved of God and men, whose memory is in benediction, he made him like the saints in glory, and magnified him in fear of his enemies, and with his words he made prodigies to cease. He glorified him in the sight of kings, and gave him commandments in the sight of his people, and showed him his glory. He sanctified him in his faith and meekness, and chose him out of all flesh. For he heard him and his voice, and brought him into a cloud, and he gave him commandment before his face, and the law of life and instruction. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. <clears throat> At that time, Peter said to Jesus, Behold, we have left all things and have followed thee. What therefore shall we have? And Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you that you who have followed me in the rege regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the seat of his majesty, you also shall sit on, a tw on twelve seats, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath left house and brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold, and shall possess life everlasting. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. <clears throat> we begin our Maria for any assistance. <clears throat> our Maria, grasp the planet, all mistaken. Benecta Tornibus, and Benecta Structus Ventis to Jesus. So today's saint, <clears throat> Saint Francis Borgia, he, the story of his life before he became a Jesuit, uh, the superior of that order, a great saint. His uh, moment of conversion or a change of life was when he looked at the, uh, the face of the Queen of Spain <clears throat> after she died for a couple days and saw how death was taking its toll on the body, how the beauty quickly vanished. So he decided, God's call to, uh, after his, wife, his own wife died, Join the religious life. <clears throat> so death is one of the, what we call one of the four last things, and important to uh, review these as not only for your, ourselves here, but also you know, as we're called to spread the faith. And there's nothing one of the greatest joys of a traditional priest is to hear the faithful bring say, "Father, this person wants to become Catholic," and that actually happened. I was in Canada last couple of weeks. Two people. Are now Catholic. So don't forget, you have to bring people to the true faith and not just save your own souls. And one of those things that they have to believe in is the four last things. Well, it's purgatory also. It's not strictly speaking the four last things, but it's also included in that category, which we should talk about today. As you know, there's hardly any faith left in this world. People walking in the streets are more concerned about what kind of mask they're wearing besides what, what are the four last things. Or probably nothing, no idea what, what you're talking about. So there's lots of, um, you know, lots of potential out there to bring people to the true faith, but we have to make that step or God, be surprised what God, what persons God puts in your life that you might have to uh, make that move. So let's review these uh, important truths using the old catechal instructions of Father Shoup written over a century ago. This is what he said. We must believe the four last things which relate to men so that we may keep them always before our eyes. For it is a most powerful means to excite in our heart hatred of sin and love of virtue. As the Holy Ghost says in the Holy Scripture, In all thy works, remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. Now we call the last things last events in which all men are interested. They, there are four of them, death, judgment, hell, and heaven. 
The first two, death and judgment, are the inheritance of all men. The third one are those, hell is for those who die in the state of mortal sin. And the fourth one, heaven, are for those who die in the state of grace and have no stain on their soul. They're perfectly pure, as nothing defiled can enter heaven and behold the face of God. First of all, the first one, death. Death is a separation of the soul and body. The soul being immortal passes to a new place to which God assigns it according to its merits. The body remains here below, decomposes, corrupts, and changes into dust which mingles with the earth. A Catholic faith teaches us, first of all, that all men must once die. Secondly, that the day and hour of death are unknown or uncertain. Thirdly, that death brings to an end the time in which man may acquire supernatural merit and irrevocably determines the eternal lot of each one according to the merit of his works. Fourthly, that death is a punishment of original sin. And fifthly, that Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, has vanquished death and merited for us a future resurrection. As mentioned, <clears throat> death is a punishment of sin. To explain that a little bit more, it is true that man is mortal of his nature, independently of sin. But God, by his grace, rendered him Im immortal in the person of Adam, who was to transmit immortality with innocence to all his descendants. But as we know, Adam, by his sin, forfeited and lost the privilege of immort immortality. And thus God punished him with death, and not only him, but also all his descendants. In death, then, we suffer the punishment of sin. Now, concerning death, there are two truths which we should never forget, namely that no one shall escape death, and that it may overtake us when we least expect it. God has left us ignorant of the hour of our death in order that we may always be prepared to appear before him <clears throat> according to these words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself when he said in the gospel, Watch, for you know not the, the, the day nor the hour. The second of the last things, of the four last things, is the judgment. After death comes judgment. Faith teaches us that there are two judgments, the particular judgment and the general judgment. The last or general judgment will take place at the end of the world, after the general resurrection. The particular judgment will happen immediately after our death. When a man dies, his soul, leaving his body, appears before the tribunal of Jesus Christ to be judged. According to these words of the Apostle St. Paul, when he said, after death, the judgment. The sentence pronounced is put into execution without delay, and the soul is committed to the place which it, it has merited. The thought of this judgment, which has caused the greatest saints to tremble, ought also to inspire us with a holy fear. Why? <clears throat> because, first of all, it will include all the thoughts, words, deeds, and desires of our life, as well as the abuse or abuse we have made of divine grace, of the talents and all the gifts that God has given us. Secondly, we will be judged in reference to the good we have done that we may be rewarded and in reference to the evil that we may be punished for. And thirdly, nothing shall escape the scrutiny of the judge and our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us that we shall, we shall have to answer for every, even every idle word. In short, there are three possibilities. Heaven, hell, or purgatory. The third of the last three, four last end, four last things <clears throat> is hell. Very briefly, the dogma of referring to hell is the most dread-inspiring truth of our faith. Yes, faith teaches us that there is a hell. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ, 15 different times, repeats in his gospel that there is a hell. If the existence of hell were only probable, even that, we, should, we, ought, we ought to be saints, that we should merit, merit it. But considering that is an unquestionable truth, what should be our preparation? 
or precaution. Indeed, there is a hell, and the damned suffer there two different kinds of punishments, the pain of loss and the pain of sins. Very briefly, the pain of loss, being without the, the beatific vision, surpasses all that we can imagine and is most painful. Why? Because the damned, drawn towards God as towards the center of all their aspirations, are eternally repulsed by his anger. Secondly, the pain of sense in hell is a torment caused by the never-dying worm of conscience, by the absence of all hope, of every consolation, and by the intensity of the devouring fire which shall never be extinguished. <clears throat> now, Holy Scripture calls the never-dying worm of conscience that cruel memory which unceasingly reproaches the damned for having brought about their loss by their mortal sins while they could have been easily saved on earth if they avoided such things. Also of having rejected the grace of their conversion and so frequently abused the mercy of God. Secondly, the damned suffer without the faintest glimmer of hope, without having the slightest probability of ever seeing an end to their torments, and without any consolation, either on the part of God or the demons around them or of their lost associates which surround them. And thirdly, the fire of hell surpasses in intensity and fury the fire of the most raging furnaces that we can think of on this earth. As the Holy Bible says, which of you can dwell with devouring fire? Which of you that shall dwell with everlasting burnings? What cruelly increases the sufferings of the damned is that their sufferings are in vain, without any merit while on earth the most trivial penance was meritorious. And such, in brief, is the dogma of hell. Now, one single mortal sin suffices to deserve hell, because every mortal sin kills a soul, makes us enemies of God, and includes infinite malice. <coughs> let us then fear mortal sin, let us especially fear to live in that state, lest dying we be buried in the abyss of eternal despair. And the fourth last thing, heaven. Heaven is a place of, <clears throat> of glory and felicity <clears throat> where the elect enjoy God in eternal happiness. And what is happiness? Happiness is enjoyment of every good <clears throat> and an exemption from every evil. It is in no wise exists perfectly on this earth. And man cannot attain it until after the present life. The happiness with which we have been created is called beatitude. St. Thomas Aquinas defines beatitude as follows. He says it is a supreme good destined to fully satiate the reasonable desires of the human heart. This is to be found in God and in God alone, since he only is the supreme good. The beatitude enjoyed by the heavenly host is a perfect beatitude, absolutely excluding all that is evil and embodying all that is good for the body and soul. Beatitude of the soul, beatitude is properly speaking, and called essential, will be the source of that of the body. On the day of the resurrection, it will diffuse itself in the bodily substance, as does the ray of light in the crystal which surrounds it. It consists in the possession and enjoyment of God by the beatific, beatific vision. Now we call the beatific, beatific or intuitive vision of God the loving contemplation of the divine essence. The elect are admitted into the presence of God as well-beloved children in the presence of a father who discloses to them all his riches. They see God face to face in all his beauty in all the splendor of his amiability. And seeing him, they love him with all the ardor of their affections. And they become, they become like unto him, as far as a creature can be like unto the creator. As St. John the Apostle and Evangelist says, <clears throat> he writes, We shall be like unto him, for we shall see him as he is. Their love, as it were, deifies them. Now, human intelligence 
incapable by its nature to appreciate the splendor of the divine essence, must needs, must needs be elevated to a state superior to its natural condition. Receive, in other words, a new power to contemplate the uncreated world, as it did in the past the created world. And this new power, or light, with which human intelligence is endowed in heaven is called the light of glory. Enlightened by this light of glory, the souls of the blessed see God himself and all things in God. They comprehend, for example, the supernatural mysteries of the Holy Trinity and all the other mysteries. They also know that all that takes place in the world and is done by creatures in as much as they are interested. For example, the saints see the honor we render them, we render them on earth by our prayers or we offer masses for them. Pre parish priests in heaven see their flocks. Parents in heaven see their children. Children in heaven see their parents. In a word, all see and know what is of interest and pleasure to them. And since the happiness of heaven is so great, should we not be willingly bear the trials and crosses of this life to merit it? The St. Paul the Apostle says, the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. And as mentioned, we'll talk about purgatory since not strictly one of the four last things, but it's always connected with it since uh, it happens to most people that die. I mean, well, it's one of those thing, options that when people die and it only ends at the end of time, end of the world. As we mentioned earlier, after death, the souls of the fable, according to the Mers, works of merited, go to heaven, either heaven, hell, or purgatory. What is purgatory? Purgatory is a place of temporary expiation. And the sufferings there endured are of two kinds, just like hell, the pain of loss and the pain of sense. The pain of sense this is, the, is the delay or privation of, for a time, of the beatific vision. As regards the pain of sense, its nature is not defined by the Church, but according to the common opinion of theologians, as, such as St. Thomas and St. Augustine, and Christ of Fire and other sufferings. These punishments are most intense. They surpass all the pains of this life, not equaling, however, the horror of the sufferings of hell. They are softened by the cons consolations of hope and differ in intensity according to the state of each one. These terrible chastisements are inflicted on the souls for various reasons. First of all, because they do not perform on earth the penances which God required for their mortal sins, of which they have received pardon in the sacrament of confession. Secondly, because they do not make reparation on earth for their venial sins, however trivial they may have been. These chastisements, as just as they are rigorous, teach us the malice of the smallest venial sin in the eyes of God. How long the period of expiation in purgatory lasts, we do not know. It is, however, proportionate to each one's state. The opinion which teaches that it may be prolonged for years is approved by the practice of the Church, which always allows for an indefinite, indefinite period the celebration of anniversary masses for the dead. Secondly, the souls in purgatory, in the midst of their sufferings, enjoy the sweetest consolation, the sweet consolation of being certain of their salvation. Moreover, they can no longer sin, and they suffer with the most invariable patience and with the most perfect resignation. Though incapable of assisting themselves by their prayers, the common opinion of theologians is that they pray for us who help, help them with, with their prayers here on earth. The means which, by which we can succor them are prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and other good works, the application of indulgences, of course, and above all, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Therefore, let us pray and never forget to pray for, for those souls in purgatory, especially those who are close to us in this life, our relatives and friends. As mentioned, the smallest faults, even the meal of sin, punish them with such severity. So don't expect, as those in Noah's Order Church, expect everybody goes to heaven when they die. Last but not least, we should keep in mind, of course, the special anniversary coming up on Tuesday, 103 years 
since the great miracle of the sun and Our Lady of Fatima's last appearance to the three shepherd children at Fatima. Still a long way to go. Her requests have not been, have been heeded to in, in, in large part, especially, of course, Russia has not been consecrated to Immaculate Heart by the Pope and the bishops. And that is, you could say, the, the simple answer to why there's so much craziness in the world and craziness in the Church of Vatican II. Rome has to be converted first before the Pope gets the grace and the bishops to do this important event. As mentioned, Rome is still not converted. The latest is that they're planning on October 15th, is later on this week, they will host a virtual meeting to promote the so-called Global Compact on Education in order to create a new humanism and the place of human person at the center by focusing on constructive dialogue, openness to others, patient listening, and inclusive education. It has no interest in promoting the true Catholic faith and its supernatural ends. Instead, his goal is a secular and humanistic paradise on earth, focusing on fraternity, the earth, and the environment, a revolutionary movement to control the education of youth, which enables them to indoctrinate them in their formative years when they are most manageable. Martyrs, pagan Rome, and those ordered church, the counterfeit church of Vatican II, are using their hierarchy and resources, such as billionaires and global elites, in order to poison, spiritually poison the children of the world. So that's just a little bit of what's happening in Rome right now. As I mentioned, it's a long way from true conversion. And so we have to keep praying the rosary and devotion and back at heart. Especially have time to do all 15 decades every day. So that the Pope will get the grace and the bishops of the world to convert, to consecrate Russia to back at heart. To bring about her triumph and end to this, all this craziness. Amen. Lady Fatima, pray for us. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.